everyone, welcome back to Like Razorblade Pie, a bite-sized book club about the short speculative fiction of Harlan Ellison, my favorite author of all time. I'm not saying the best writer of all time for reasons that will become very clear as we progress. <laughs> um, oh, maybe even by that giggle, Sorry. it might be clear to you already. Um, but as I usually do, I wanted to say uh, just a little context up front, uh, we'll be covering Repent Harlequin said the TikTok man today. Yes, it's a long name. Get used to it. It's Harlan Ellison. Um, and uh, it's a story that uh, first appeared in a, a, a thing called Pain God and Other Delusions. That's one word, Pain God. And um, to give you an idea of the stories inside that collection, uh, very early in Ellison's career, the cover is an angel being tortured by a demon who's kind of off frame. But oh. um, just so the idea of like bad things defiling good things, uh, this is not going to be a pleasant ride. And it starts with an introduction. As you know, if you've been listening to the series, one of my favorite things about Harlan is he is not mysterious at all. He explains all his stories. He does long, some say obnoxious essays before each story saying, Look, if you don't understand the story, it's about this. If you think it's about something else, you're fucking stupid. It's clearly about this. Um, and I like that for reasons that we'll discuss. But in the introduction to Pain God, in all caps, he says, are you aware of how much pain there is in the world? And then he does this long thing about how, yes, he is aware of that. And sometimes it seems trite. Sometimes it seems profound. Sometimes it crushes him with the weight of um, all the pain that there is in the world. And sometimes that seems like a silly self-centered notion, right? Um, so all the ways you can approach that thought. And uh, he mentions a few different kinds of pain I think are worthy of our attention. Uh, he says, the other night I had dinner with a good friend. We talked about an anguish that they have been experiencing for a number of years. She's afraid of dying alone and unloved. If you've never felt this pain, you're either an alien from Arcturus or so insensitive your demise probably won't matter much, or you're very lucky. Her problem is best summed up by something Theodore Sturgeon once said. <laughs> There's no absence of love in the world, only worthy places to put it. Uh, and I think that's a good place to introduce a worthy place to put your love, if ever there was one. Oh, uh, my Vaughn oh, pal and yours, podcast host, writer, comedian extraordinaire, Mr. Alex Schmidt. Welcome, Alex. It's really nice to be here. And I, I know I <laughs> booped the surprise a little bit if people know my laugh. Oh, but, all good. Uh, yeah. It, it, but really, thanks, man. This is really exciting. And and this is a cool show. I have read a bit of Ellison and not a lot. And this was a great opportunity to like get more, you know? Yeah, the most gratifying thing about the show so far is I do know at least a few people, even in my actual life, and then of course some handful of internet folks, shout out internet, uh, who are reading along. And I I don't know what I expected, but um, but I'm so <laughs> gratified that people actually are. I mean, when we did Vana Guys, the people that actively read the novels with us along, that, right. it's so cool to think of, uh, I guess the the time that people are actually willing to put into this. Um, so thank you if you are reading along. I do think you get a lot more out of the podcast. It's kind of an odd podcast to listen to if you haven't read a scrap of the thing we're discussing. But nevertheless, you're welcome as well. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about... Uh, well, I have a question that I always ask on this show. And I'm flipping through the intro to make sure there's nothing else I want to... Yeah, he talks about all these kinds of pain and then he says which is crazy because he just did a long intro, but it's shorter than his usual intros. He ends by saying this, I usually do a long intro, but I'm just so tired. This, in, this book has no intro. And you're like, bitch, that just was an intro. But, um, <laughs> but basically- but By my said, standards yeah, as Harlem, yeah. it was nothing. It was this dirt. This is phoning it in, yeah. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, this story, I think that's the crucial piece of context we can glean from that. This story is in a collection that he thinks is all about, I'm fed up, it's too much, I'm tired, it's just pain, the world is just pain. Um, and and interestingly, I wouldn't call the story we're covering that brutal or dark or gruesome. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to launch into it with the question I always ask, uh, why do you think I paired Repent Harlequin said the TikTok man with you specifically? Because <laughs> I always have a reason. I and like first thing I thought was that it was an honor to get chosen for this particular story because mm -hmm. it's one of the few that I've 
heard of I, I don't know if i've heard of it mainly for its like greatness or for it as a prototypical example of one of his long titles you know because mm-hmm. it's it's i guess it's shorter than the beast that shouted love at love the, at the heart, heart of the world, of the world. Or something. Yeah. that's the other one i've heard of the world. <laughs> but yeah this one he <laughs> he invokes the phrase and so it goes pretty frequently which relates to a, a vonnegut saying so it goes and mm-hmm. i also if it had been like gun to my head who invented that phrase, I probably would have said Vonnegut prior to reading this story that came out before Slaughterhouse-Five. And then I, I Googled and apparently just <gasps> so it goes was a phrase in the world. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly who came up with it at all. It might just yeah. be out there. But the phrase and also the general structure of the story and the style of telling it, it feels very metafictional and very Vonnegut to me. Uh, and then um, also the like science fiction, but... Like you say, like I, so I also listened to the episode of the show about Deathbird. And then I was mm. like, I should read Deathbird to like find out what's going on. That, yeah. is, that is much bleaker and much more confessional than yeah. the story is. Like the story is about such a fundamental problem and uh, kind of a grief we can all feel from time to time. But, uh, you know, it reminds me of some of Vonnegut's stuff like Harrison Bergeron, where it is about a dark thing. It is about a hard thing, but there's a lot of like lightness and joy and uh, creativity to it. Yeah, and Deathbird, in terms of what it throws at you, is like cuckoo bananas, right? Like, it does the test questions, yeah. and uh, it's very um, postmodern, I guess would be the word. I, uh, yeah, yeah this, is, this is a pain you can wrap your head around. It's, it's not, I have no mouth and I must scream. It's like, very specific gripe. Not a great title. Yeah. Um, another thing in the intro he <laughs> says is it's no coincidence that Harlan sounds like Harlequin. He was always late. Oh. That's where the story comes from. He thinks he's... I mean, I, I roll my eyes a bit as I say it, but he see, he thinks he's the Joker, baby. Like uh, his the vibe <laughs> you get from reading all of his works is he thinks he's like the grinning, winking, chaotic little imp who's going to, you know, uh, say the emperor has no clothes. That's kind of the role he feels he has for himself. Um, yeah. So it was that. But also specifically, I guess, because I'm organizationally minded. Um, yeah. If you're somehow unaware, Alex and I did a phenomenal I'll say there's been enough distance. I can say that objectively. Great podcast Woo. called Vonnegut Guys, Woo. where we went through all the works of Kurt Vonnegut and then some um, some docs about Kurt Vonnegut and talked with some people who have done notable Vonnegut-centric stuff. Um, so obviously, I didn't want I didn't want to start the series with an Alex episode, um, but I knew yeah. it would be a big deal when I hopefully had you on. Oh, and thanks. I decided to start with a story that I think pairs perfectly with the first thing we covered on Vana Guys, uh, Player Piano. So, oh, big time. Yeah, big time. Yes. So that's, uh, I guess I'm omitting one thing if for the folks who don't read along. I need a mildly insulting name for the no readerinos. We'll figure out a name for them. Um, what's the story in a nutshell, if you could, Alex? Yeah, we, we got to do that up top. Yeah, it's the, the other not related to me thing I kept thinking of was Batman. Like it's, it's almost like sort of Batman stories, but with a very positive, lighthearted Joker. Like it's lighter than every gritty Batman story. It's yeah. less silly than Adam West, but otherwise it's very uh, fun. And he wears uh, uh, motley and rides a little flying. Like he's essentially the Green Goblin in the Jelly Bean scene for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's it's a world where basically just through the progression of people deciding it's worth it, especially for capitalist reasons, like the world is very regimented by time. Like technology is advanced, life is very urban, at least in what we see, but. Everything is regimented by time, and there's someone called the TikTok man who is kind of overseeing it and has a vast power over it that seems to mostly be political. I can't quite tell. But then there's someone opposing him called the Harlequin, who is going around like doing foofy, goofy pranks, like dumping jelly beans all over the whole city. But then each time that disrupts the mechanization and the schedules, the TikTok man gets more angry. And spoiler, eventually they capture him, do a 1984 torture to him, and then make him go along with everything. Uh, And along the way, we meet the Harlequin's partner, Alice, and we also hear the story of another guy who gets turned off by the TikTok man. Mm -hmm. Because they have such like temporal control over life that as you quote unquote waste time, they like tabulate it. They deduct it from your life and turn you off if you've used up all your time. Yeah, they dock you. Everyone has a heart implant that they can 
uh, that the state can tax time from. Um, yeah. And I'm realizing, I'm glad you read, it's fortuitous that you read Deathbird because it's another one where he does it. And it's funny, over re- everything's a magic trick when you experience it first or in a vacuum. But, you know, over the course of doing our pod, of course, you start to realize, oh, Vonnegut does have um, things he's interested, or like patterns. Everyone has specifics. And uh, I realize now, just like Deathbird, one thing Ellison loves to do is two thirds of the way through the story that's had almost like a, a jocular, like sardonic vibe. He'll stop and go, now let me tell you like a very earnest story of someone who actually suffered because of this. In Deathbird, it's the true story of burying his dog. In this, he's like, let's stop down and get real and like turn the chair backwards and talk about this dude who really got his heart taxed until he died desperately in the woods. And you're like, oh boy. So he loves to set the stakes out of order, which is an interesting yeah. uh technique i think and i wanted to ask uh specifically with player piano which in an extreme nutshell because this is not going to turn into a vonnegut podcast is about (laughs) a mechanized world um and the you know the soullessness of taking meaningful in that case employment in some ways away from people and not having a role or not having a meaningful like place in society because you're getting automated out uh And then Harrison Bergeron, which you already alluded to, his short story famously about what if everyone was forced to be equal no matter what, and the state like put weights on you if you run too fast, et cetera. Um, How does this, like just balance those things in your head, and I'm wondering how does this, how did Harlan hit you? You said you had read a little. I find him to be a very unique author, but both stylistically and like the message, how do you think it stacks up against things like the Vonnegut stuff that we've covered? Oh, I, yeah, I think as far as the specific, especially player piano, this Mm. story, I think achieves that much more powerfully and in much less time. And and that's partly because Vonnegut is beginning to learn to write a novel by writing a novel with player piano. It's his first one. There's many years between that and his other work that is much more effective as a novel. And yeah. the, the other Ellison I've read is now Deathbird and then A Boy and His Dog and uh, and then sort of by osmosis, the Star Trek episode City on the Edge of Forever. Oh, sure. Yeah, which yeah. is amazing. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd find him like much grittier than Vonnegut kind of across the board. But this this Repent Harlequin story is an exception. It's It's sort of that Vonnegut tone, especially... Like that early tone in player piano and in the short stories, it's it's really, hey, it's been the 1950s recently, and you know if the if the jet age continues and we're all Jetsons, also it could be kind of messed up. Is is sort of yeah. the broad tone of both those things. I do think the mess, the core message in both cases has become dated, is the word for sure, almost quaint. Um, which is not great, you guys, because that means like, well, I mean to the point where, um. You know, an old man, both these gentlemen have passed now, but a a very old voice saying, uh, man, if this goes the wrong way, we'll have no privacy and everything will be automated. And we're like, it is, dude. We're already used to it. That's already done. Um, (laughs) Forget that. We're past that. That happened. You were right. But now you just seem quaint or like it, it is uh r slash i'm 14 and this is so deep kind of at this point which uh i find very (laughs) fascinating because um this is also an early early ellison story and i do think it's such a classic and and like repent harlequin tiktok man for me is most embedded in my life as a sensory experience as this giant i had and i mean giant a uh, like book that was just this short story fully illustrated by i think his name is dave mckeon he did like stinky cheese man and other oh wow fracture Fra- he's a very specific weird artist he works with neil gaiman a lot and uh it was a copy of repent harlequin and my parents presented that to me as a child and i'm not denigrating the message but i actually do think it's kind of an appropriate like young adult almost uh message yeah. like you gotta you know stick up for yourself value yourself um there's someone I forget who said it, but something I just saw on Twitter that was blowing up was, uh, 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 I wish I knew, let's see, when I was young, I wish I did more stuff because now that I'm an adult, I know that being in trouble is a fake idea. Uh, and I think that's sort of the <laughs> message of uh, Repent Harlequin. Player Piano slightly leans towards also specific issues he had with like GM, like 
Yeah. Uh, they're taking jobs <laughs> away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, or GE. Yeah. And I don't know how I feel, like, whether I agree or disagree per se. I don't have a dog in that fight. Um, but it's interesting you mentioned, I do think Ellison is grimier for sure across the board. Yeah. Uh, this one feels cute and jangly and not tied together in the way that I thought Player Piano also did, where it's the world building, I mean, where I'm like, you couldn't do a novel in the world of the whatever the the tiktok man or the his official name like the curator of time uh, yeah, the, the society or whatever yeah the society's <laughs> like dumb on its face it's not meant to hold together for a long period of time right um, yeah. whereas i gotta say i find the harrison berger on reality chilling and realistic like for some reason that one feels <laughs> concrete to me and scares me um yeah i don't know yeah i'm interested that, how other people who have read all of them feel but that that reminds me of a Vonnegut connection I forgot which also mm -hmm. felt I was like oh this is very attuned to me I really appreciate it which is that yeah. I feel like Allison does an amazing job in this short story of using your time well like there was a big Vonnegut trope truism of him as a writer like you should use the reader's time well no matter what and like you're right this story probably couldn't the the like universe of it couldn't sustain a whole novel and it's not supposed to he's just really deftly thoughtfully cut it down to exactly what you need to the point where there's a part toward the end where he says like, well, he just says, and they do the torture from 1984. You get it. You're smart. Like, I, I don't need to waste your time. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask next. So it sounds like that's inbounds for you. You appreciated that or thought it was clever, funny or like how, because yeah. I could also see a take of that's cheating or that's shoddy writing. You know what I mean? Because to be clear, oh, yeah, yeah. At yeah. the end of this, he says, uh, and I love the way he phrases it. I'm paraphrasing because I don't want to flip around, but something like the specific phrasing and what the hell they caught him. Like that's how yeah. the Harlequin gets caught. He goes like, then some more stuff happened and what the hell they caught him and tell you what they did the torture from 1984 on him. And just like Winston, he totally was brainwashed. Um, that's very interesting to me because even though I would say, <laughs> especially coming hot off Deathbird, this feels so traditional. There's still these little ways in which, yeah. just like the Harlequin, I guess, uh, Ellison can't not screw with the medium. He's super postmodern, always, even when the story doesn't seem that way. Um, like this story literally also starts with him saying, this is the middle of the story. And he tells a chunk and then he goes, now let's go back to the beginning and the end will take care of itself. Um I love when form cool. follows functions. Like in a story about fucking with time, the story time is fucked with. Um, yeah. But yeah, how did that kind of stuff hit you? Because I feel like Vonnegut's thing is more to be conversational and put it in plain English in a way where you're like, that's so wise and said so simply. Um, Ellison's thing is to be like, look, I'm clever. I did a little thing. <laughs> how does that, how'd that come right. across to you? Yeah, uh, you're right. And I, I think it, it was distinct from Vonnegut and good like it, and I think it especially helps this age well like it the story feels old-fashioned and the lightness of it I think but it feels very modern to me reading it now even though it's been I guess close to 60 years uh it, it yeah, feels geez. very fresh in terms of no 70 years wow close to 70 years uh it feels very fresh in terms of just moving on with that kind of thing like it, it gets on with it all of the time, pretty much every time. The only, if there's one spot that felt like a little old fashioned, it was the Thoreau quote at the very start. I, I feel like a really, really modern author would just say that first line you mentioned of, I'm going to start in the middle, then get to the beginning, then get to the end. Yeah, that's, it's very chunky. Uh, yeah. He does use opening quotes frequently but i think this is one of the longest ones i've ever seen i'm just going to read a abbreviated bit it's from civil disobedience uh henry david thoreau says the mass of men serve the state not as men mainly but as machines with their bodies others serve the state chiefly with their heads and as they rarely make any moral distinctions they are as likely to serve the devil as god a very few heroes patriots martyrs reformers and men uh, had to throw men in there, serve the state with their consciences also, and so necessarily resist it for the most part, and they are commonly treated as enemies by it. Um, a quote I know that is used uh, on social media by just the worst people to defend any horrible thing they think, uh, like, it's my, I, I'm resisting the state, that makes this valid. Uh, mm -hmm. I hate X group. 
Um, but anyway, I also think if you take it in good faith, obviously, it's it explains the whole story. Um, so do you see yeah. that as a positive or a negative? Because as I said, I didn't I don't think I, I sent it to you in a PDF, I believe. So you didn't necessarily read the acknowledgments, then the intro. Then there's an intro to the story that is separate from the intro to the book. Um, and in all oh. three, he explains what the story repent Harlequin TikTok man. He's <laughs> like, this is what it's about. Uh, here's how I thought of it. I used to be late a lot. Someone called me out on it. I was like, fuck you. I'm the Joker baby. And I wrote the story. And then he has a throw <laughs> quote up top that says basically the soul of the meaning of the story. And then he tells yeah. the story. Yeah. Uh, and, too I, much. <laughs> yeah. Like it was the Thoreau wasn't good or bad to me. It was just a uh, repetition. And like, I, I one of the first things I did with this story was just Google the publication year because I because yeah. my feeling is like okay if if I was a 1965 reader maybe this is helpful to me and in in 2022 I'm I'm okay without it you know yeah the one thing I think it appeals to just by being there at all is that this is a timeless idea I'm gonna tackle right now but that could have been oh, sure. just you know, martyrs serve the state with their conscience or whatever and our branded enemies uh, David Thoreau. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you could punch that up for sure. Um, yeah. I do love, uh, I didn't know I'm, I'm gosh, you're out hosting me on my own show, but I didn't know that it predated slaughterhouse five. That's incredible to me. Um, did glare. I did pair the story with you before I realized that it has, um, not just the phrase, so it goes, but, uh, a period where it goes and so it goes and then another sentence and so it goes and then another sentence and so it goes. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to say, I did look into it and I have confirmed that Vonnegut and Ellison, like admired each other's work, were friendly, had oh, mutual cool. friends. So like, it's all good, but, uh, <laughs> okay. There's one, I, I feel like I'm talking too much. So I want to ask what, uh, if you're going to stump for Vonnegut here, I don't know why I'm having to pair them or like pit them against each other, but. <laughs> Let's just say, what did anything about the story fall flat for you, rub you the wrong way, since we mentioned the Thoreau thing was a little pacing bump? Oh, yeah. Uh, otherwise, not really. Uh, I mean, and you you sent me like a list of things we might talk about, and one of them was yeah. the character of Alice and, uh, and her being the only woman in the book, as far as I know, and, and kind of not the book, the story. But I found that pretty effective, actually. Because uh, I also mm. think it's questionable whether the TikTok man actually got a hold of the Harlequin through Alice. It seems like he has a pretty comprehensive grasp on all of society and could have just got him either way. And then just mm. says, like, uh, to make it maximum painful, your wife led you in. But, you know, it, it, she might not have done that. And uh, I, I sort of expected to bump on the writing of the female character. And I actually thought mm. he did a good job of making clear that the Harlequin is not paying attention to her pretty plain asks for what she needs in the relationship. And is is like, like being him works great, except in your most intimate relationships, then you need to be more graspable and, and more there, I think. Yeah. The one, their one direct interaction that's actually a scene we see is basically him telling her that he'll be a certain place at a certain time. And she's like, why do you even bother? Yeah. You're telling you're me that. The so, so let's tackle the central, <laughs> issue then um because what's interesting to that is we know harlan wrote this about actually being late frequently himself and his friends and relatives reflecting back to him that that sucks and him going no it is society that is wrong we have we're too regimented um where do you land on that i think the story interestingly lays out pros and cons obviously this is a society of conformity gone mad you shouldn't be unplugging people's hearts but also right it's interesting that as you say he's not it sucks for Alice that he won't be anywhere at the time he said he would. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, and he I also think by spinning out the science fiction world, Harlan separates it between like, is Harlan's behavior OK? And is the Harlequin's behavior OK? Because like mm -hmm. Harlan, I, I don't know the exact timing of his lateness and you might know better, but that's more OK. Like the Harlequin needs to be a freedom fighter who also brings his loved one along. Like this is higher stakes. This is a bigger thing that mm. the harlequin's dealing with harlan if he's chronically late maybe his people can get used to it somewhat and he should adjust that it feels chiller to me yeah 
So it does, but it does feel like an act of revolution to you. And I guess, so when, if we compare to something like Harrison Bergeron, like how on point, I guess, do you think is the dread, right? So someone wrote oh, this story yeah. that's like, beware every, the government trying to force everyone to be equal. Um, and I'm just mulling over, this is not on the list. Sorry, I'm going rogue, but I'm real, mulling over yeah. in real time. Like, has that come to fruition? Is that a problem? Or like player piano. I actually would argue, I believe, as I said on the Vonda guys episode, that I think that's kind of a complicated issue. There might be a painful transition period where people don't have jobs and therefore aren't entitled to resources. But I do believe humanity can and should and will eventually get to the point where people are valuable intrinsically and don't have to work to earn resources. And that's mm. good to me. Like, I believe in the Star Trek post need future uh, and that that would be chill. And so I don't I think automation is like a short term evil, but eventually technology is good. It's what gives us the power to affect change in the universe um, if it's used for good. But uh, but Harrison Bergeron. So so I want to hone it in. Like, how do you feel? How how cromulent or how cogent is this? Do you feel like yeah. we're on a strict clock? Do you think that hurts society? Do you think? We're all fucking robots, you know, living in too much under too much stress until we die in our cubicles. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're right about automation being a step toward a good thing. And then this story, um, Repent Harlequin, really reminded me of the attention economy and the way that we're all sort of pressed to spend our time in the most profitable way and then our attention is being competed for very aggressively all the time like i, I think that mm. could all could almost happen in parallel with a positive universal basic income support for everybody type of situation like yeah. that good thing could happen and then also our uh Attention, that's still the word, could be so demanded from so many different directions that that could be negative. That I did not expect this to happen, but um, you're making me realize that. Or like, so my partner, Jen, I would say the most time they spend engaged attention wise in something each day that's not work is TikTok. Uh, so there's <laughs> resonance between TikTok and TikTok man. Like uh, she knows the TikTok man. Wow, yeah, you're cool. totally right. The uh, <laughs> I forget what he's actually called. All Father, Timekeeper of Forever, or yeah. something. But uh, it it is a freaky parallel with that popular current app. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> that it's. But you're right. The demand for time and attention, um, as we do, and it's interesting how we're seeing. Like COVID and the pandemic obviously spurred it, but I do think there's something organic about the things that's happening with the great, the quiet resignation, or quiet quitting, the great resignation, people are calling it, <laughs> where um, people are, when possible, trying to go or like pressuring, like, can I go full remote? Can I restructure the way work it could work be on a flexible schedule? And I do stuff I want, you know, I feel like people, mm -hmm. there's more unionizing lately. People are trying to, there's a wave of trying to make that argument versus like the owners of the uh, means of production who are, uh, even the fact that we now see a pushback, like I'm seeing a lot of articles that are like, people are now scared and keeping their jobs because all, everyone's getting laid off. Um, mm -hmm. that dialogue bouncing back and forth still to me is a sign that that conversation is happening of like, what could we've advanced to the point where we could work less? Do we have to work 40 hours a week every, you know? Uh, yeah. and with that extra free time that some of us have the privilege to accrue, it's wild that that is monetized and divvied up to you look at your phone, it tracks your eyes and an algorithm is like, Okay, they only looked at that for two seconds. They don't like that. Move on. Like next TikTok, next TikTok, uh, <laughs> yeah. and it it's kind of is draining your time away till you die. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, we need to start a competing app called Harlequin. <laughs> I don't know what it would do. It just won't open. So you go out in the real world. Right. <laughs> yeah. It just bricks your phone. Yeah. Yeah. This. <laughs> I, I think the story will my prediction is that it will be kind of always relevant and exciting because yeah, I think there's sort of that endless arms race almost of like, as we automate more, it does free us up in a lot of ways. It does let us do things a lot of ways. And then capitalism, I think still is like, okay, now that there's more room, how do we like 
get more Monetize eyeballs? Your How free do we time. harvest more Now brains? you have free time to spend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything is subsumed to capitalism. Like even uh, like even sometimes yeah. I'll see be watching a set of TikToks and there start to be a few in a row that are saying like, hey, viewer, you should be doing a side hustle. Like, if you have this time, like, you should be selling stickers on Etsy in a way that makes you passive income. Like, that's obviously what you should be slimes. doing. You're an idiot. You gotta if make you're not. slimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's always int- kind of the push. Yeah. Uh, I would say Jen works too hard as it is and has a good job with a decent salary. And they just signed up for to like DoorDash stuff if they have free time. And the app, you know, they're like, yeah, well, I saw it on TikTok. And if it aligns and I'm already driving around maybe i'll pick up someone's food and deliver it for a tip and i'm like man the tiktok man has got you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's an optimization like there, there's yeah. uh, and and then we also have an intrinsic want to be optimal and to provide for the people around us so it, it all mm-hmm. goes hand in hand we just want it to be like positive you know? and do you think there's something positive in messing with that in injecting chaos into others lives because he doesn't just do it for himself right so so the big scene is the green goblin scene where he flies around and he drops millions of jelly beans uh on a moving walkway that mm-hmm. is optimized almost like the robot episode of Futurama where all the robots whiz by perfectly or like uh <laughs> you know self-driving cars theoretically would perfectly all align uh and yeah. it 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 breaks it right it gums up the works um what is there any like is the joker right at all or what it what's the value of chaos in society cuz i do think things you can't change without chaos right there has to be some looseness injected into the system for it to kind of flexibly I don't know. Right. What do you think about chaos vis-a-vis systems? Yeah, I think in especially in this story, I read it as a positive force because it was freeing people from like specifically capitalist functions and pleasures and everything else. Like it, it helped remind people of their own humanity. And so, so in this story, for sure, it's good. And and I think broadly in life, it's good. Yeah. I, I guess I, I I feel like I'm Karl Marx on this show. I, I have like a very <laughs> Marxist capitalist reading of this story, but that's that's where it came out. I think yeah. I think he's definitely presenting it as good. I'm just trying to figure out if I agree. I do feel like I often fall into the have fallen into the trap in life of like job is my identity. So if I yeah same yeah if this falls away, what even am I doing? And yet. Every time that has happened or the rug's been pulled up un- from under me and I have to scramble and figure out what my life is now, it always makes room for something new that's cool and interesting. And you're like, it's, I don't know, it's a weird realization that maybe, maybe this will help some younger people listening, but like, your life will not go the way you planned. It can take radical turns. And as Vonnegut said, you don't know what's good news or bad news. You always are worried like, this thing is ending. Endings feel bad. It's not in the system. It's not optimal. This was not the plan. We're all fucked now. But some chaos, like a moment of chaos, often leads to, well, now I can search for something new, and there's like eight threads I could follow, and this would be interesting, and you find yourself somewhere interesting. Uh, So I do think chaos is useful to that degree, but man, I fear it. I'm very routine-driven. Are you you routines? Like, do you do the same shit at the same time every day? I do. I... Yeah, I do like that. Yeah, it it is like maybe this is another way the story is even more relevant now is that in the 1960s, there was still more of a U.S. economy where you could work the same place for 40 years and get a gold watch mm. at the end. And so, yeah, it's, it's very helpful to uh, at least be comfortable with the death of things, the end of things, the change of things. Uh, so it's it's a handy mentality to have whether or not it's positive and even if it is stressful even if it is hard to roll with yeah i am realizing though i do always kind of on some level i think it's punching down or a cheap shot when artists (laughs) uh, in some sense the story boils down to an artist who's lucky enough to make their living doing the art that they love to do uh who's late all the time going Look at all these people working in factories, you fucking robots, <laughs> you soulless automatons. And it's like, dude, they're already living the life doing the hard factory job. You don't have to 
rub their faces in it. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I'm feeling that in this moment. Uh, I'm like, lay off the poor people on the walkway, Harlequin. Yeah. And and also, if, if, along with that, if there is a way he is cheating in the writing of this story, it's the part he kind of calls himself out on where he's like, this guy bought $150,000 of jelly beans, and we're not going to know how. Yeah, da, 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 da. yeah like where did this, he source them in this dystopian gray society? Like, where did he buy the jelly beans? <laughs> right. It's it's like if Winston in 1984 had a bunch of those, like, wacky, waving, inflatable guys from outside the car dealership mm-hmm. and just put them all over the city. Like, uh, how? Yeah, it's the not... nope guys. Yeah. <laughs> so you can uh, see why you didn't hang a whole novel on it. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because all his scams are, like, I forget you called them something funny, but yeah, they're like pranks or improv anywhere bits (laughs) because the other one he does, which I did. I don't know. It got me or I do think Harlan Ellison's very clever in the sense that uh, this is so dumb when you say it because you're like, of course, that's the only way you could go with that. But I was gratified and surprised when they go like, so the way he tricked them next time is. He announced when he was going to be somewhere and they're like, oh, he'll be late. He's always late. And he showed up 20 minutes early (laughs) and they were still setting up all the stuff and he triggered it all early and they got trapped by their own stuff. And I'm like, ah, the late guy was early. I didn't see that coming. (laughs) Like that really worked on me. (laughs) Now in retrospect, I realized like structurally where he came up with that idea, but you know, opposites, but, um, but I don't know. I find, I just find him obviously i wouldn't be doing this podcast but uh i hope you agree i just think he's like really deft in the moment his techniques are actually yeah interesting and effective so how did that uh digression uh and if you want to i would love your general thoughts on deathbird if it wouldn't be too too long but like um uh, how did that digression where they're like let's get real marshall delahanty's this guy who he just can't get his life together and they keep docking him and, you know, and they or the real disturbing part is they go to his wife and they go into her head and they talk about how uh, all she is is hoping that it's not for that. The death notice is for her husband and not for her. And it is. And she feels like relief yeah. and then guilt and then grim numbness. And you're like, yeah, this is very sad. Um, what That's do you cool. think of that technique of just dropping a like, let's get real moment in the middle? I, I thought it was really cool and and almost not even digressive. Like it, it really mm. fleshed out this world for me. And uh, and I I feel like I've heard of at least one sci fi movie or or big thing where that's the entire premise is you have a limited amount of time to be alive and the government turns it off when you run out. Like that's that's such a cool idea and that he just tosses it to off. And yeah. like just with him fleshing out. The, the ribs and guts of this world in a, in a really cool way. Yeah, it really worked for me. Yeah. Me too, although I will grant Vonnegut can do it in one line, man. When he'll sometimes, you know, <laughs> that's his signature, is he'll do a really cheerful, like, funny stand-up paragraph where you're like, that's true and funny. And then at the end, he'll be like, anyway, my mom killed herself on Mother's Day. <laughs> you're like, okay, whoa. Now yeah. we're getting real. Yeah, he'll do he'll do that turn on a dime. But I, I like harlan's way as well um and as mentioned he also kind of does the same thing in deathbird uh so real quick oh, yeah. d- did you like deathbird did you not like deathbird what'd you think deathbird was amazing i i do think when deathbird pivots into his real story of dogs in his life and and a neighbor having a dog killed and stuff that was more of a digression and and and, and took oh, yeah. a lot of it actually yeah well, in fact, in the intro, he explained that that was just an essay he wrote when his dog died and he yeah. like copy and pasted it into this story and then wrote framing around it to make it fit in the story as well as it did. Um, but yeah, Deathbird's very all over the place, which is not. Oh, well, I would say like a third of his stories are that that's his other signature thing that I fuck with, <laughs> which is I, <laughs> I like when a story is you're like, what's going on? Why are we here now? What's this? Um, Beast the Shattered Love at the Heart of the World, for example, uh, if people listen to our very first episode with Katie Stoll, I know she was she was uh, asking me very earnestly, like, what was the story about? Um, and he can go that <laughs> far sometimes. Um, but interesting that you've read A Boy and His Dog as well, because that's very, uh, I don't know what to call it, traditional. 
uh it yeah. it takes place in one place and it goes forward in time and everything makes sense yeah i, I had a very strong grasp of it throughout and and also as my you know our minds illustrate what we're reading i just kept imagining gear and stuff from the fallout games the whole time which i think helped oh my me god yes too. Yeah. Oh, it's dog meat. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's <laughs> inescapable now, that association. Um, yeah. Have you seen the movie of that? Uh, a Boy and His Dog? No, I haven't seen yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. I won't put you on the spot. I'll ask after. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, that would be a good one to cover someday, too. Anyway, moving on. Uh, ultimately... Uh, uh, we talked a little bit about like the clocks in our heads and sort of hustle culture, but I wanted to ask that again in a more primal way. Uh, and I guess a more stupid emo way because, so there's this bright eyes song called, uh, uh, arc of time. I think, um, that always has a lyric that always stuck with me, uh, about, I forget the exact wording, but like, oh, to be a blind insect, to make love to the flower bed, die in the first freeze. I want to have. So anyway, it elucidates the idea that animals don't understand. For example, a dog can't communicate to another dog. Let's meet at this tree at the same time tomorrow. There's no framework for an understanding of time as an abstract concept that you can like shuffle around in your head or schedule. Yeah. Um, and in some sense, all a lot of this trying not to stress meditating uh all this stuff about breathing being present that a lot of us including me subscribe like i subscribe to that that is good it's helpful it's a thing to try and be present animals do that all the time naturally uh <laughs> and in some sense i've always wondered if we're not trying to get back to or like it's interesting to me that i think of trans or meditating and bettering myself and calming my mind as a way to like evolve into some higher form and yet in another way i'm actually trying to recapture what animals which i consider lesser forms or whatever do naturally all the time um yeah that's all what do you think about the fact that humans can conceptualize time that's freaky huh <laughs> <laughs> why only humans and I'm yeah. sure assorted other, I'm sure chimps, someone will write and be like, chimps know time, <laughs> but whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just a bunch of emails with photo attachments of like chimps yeah. wearing watches, like subject line. Dolphins Michael, know you time, rube. you idiot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dolphin with an hourglass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish I knew what life was like before you know the 1800s or so because you read about oh there weren't that many clocks around and mm -hmm. and people were uh like they knew what time was but they i think were less driven by less driven by time because there was less expectation that everybody had the same clock as you or easy access to a clock so you couldn't like demand the regimentation in this story um uh, sorry because i think it, it's good to know that ellison a part of the spark for this was that he either felt bad about being late to stuff all the time or felt frustrated that everybody was mad at him because i think mm -hmm. i think we all suffer that way or suffer the other way which is sweating being early or on time all the time so then we do that but we suffer in order to achieve it you know like like nobody's mad at us for being late because we're on time but then it's a lot yeah. of like okay so the subway will take this long and add 15 minutes for chaos with the subway and then you know or mm -hmm. whatever freeways whatever people's limits are but yeah i think we either end up really really hustling set aside capitalism just really hustling to show up on time for people or we free ourselves from that and then suffer on the other end I think one of my most common forms of like the most common s instance where I'm really panicked is that I'm realize I'm in the car in traffic and realize I'm going to be late to something. I hate being late. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's fascinating to me, people who don't care. And then I'll realize it's all bullshit. Like I totally see both sides. So whenever we record one upsmanship, sorry to put you on blast, dude, but Adam Ganser is habitually <laughs> five to eight minutes late. And <laughs> I sit there at the time and I get really annoyed. And then I'm also like, but why it's, it's eight minutes or, you know what I mean? Like if I was in the 1300s, I'd just get up when the sun rose and you know, I'd see it. Was, yeah. So who am I to 
feel negatively about <laughs> Adam because yeah, he's eight minutes late. And yet, vi so I do get locked into you become we enforce the system ourselves as we are part of the system. Like the only reason Adam feel would feel bad about getting late is because I give him shit because I feel have I, I have a clock in my head telling me everyone has to be on time or the next thing won't be on time. Uh, <laughs> so I do think this is story is a good remedy to that or to remind you yeah. um, that life itself is not on a schedule and time is an illusion in some sense. Um, yeah, that's right. I think I, I might have, yeah. in my reading of it, almost been too literal uh, and too like macroeconomic. Like it's it's really sweet as a parable of don't worry about being late to stuff. Breathe, you know, lower your yeah. blood pressure, live longer. It's nice, you know. It's good. Also, what you said just made me think of a, an or <laughs> I was going to say an important reminder. That's a little grandiose, but something I like to meditate on a lot, which is that. Being in history times, probably even more different than we imagine. Like, I think we usually imagine someone with our kind of acculturation, but we don't have technology. We have to churn butter and we have to, and it's just like living rough. And it's like, no, man, you would think completely, you like <laughs> yeah. your internal sense of things might be different. Like, if you go back far enough, you, th you genuinely believe that. Like, you don't know what the sun is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're like, what is that fire in the sky every day? And you have no answer and you have to just accept there's a fire in the sky. I have my own personal explanation for why I believe there might be a fire in the sky. It's probably like a chariot or a wolf or something. And there's no other explanation. Like, you don't have humanity hasn't figured that out yet. So there's no that's the end of that exploration for you. Uh, and yeah, time could be totally the, your internal sense of time could be totally different. Very interesting to me. Also, I have a friend who loves to point out everything would stink so bad by our standards yep. at almost oh, yeah. any time in history. Yeah. Most of all ourselves. Like my yeah. own body would bug me the most. I think other people <laughs> yeah. would be fine. <laughs> totally. Uh, all right. Well, that brings us to uh, Harlan's parlance. Which is yeah. a very sweaty pun, but it's when I ask the guest, were there any like lines that stood out to you in, in terms of just, ooh, word for word, that was especially delicious or resonated with me? Yeah, I um, I really liked all the lines describing the behaviors of the TikTok man as a individual and like the, the vibe of him as a person to be around. I think male, I assume male. Like there was the, mm -hmm. early on, he just says the guy makes a soft purring when things went time wise, really mm -hmm. about like that. When you mentioned Vonnegut being able to land something on a line, Ellison does that at least a few times here. And every time he described that guy, I got a lot out of a little it was really cool. Yeah, the TikTok man's barely mentioned and yet feels like a Darth Vader like presence. And as you said, soup Harlan Ellison, something I admire is he wrote hundreds, if not a thousand short stories and he with very few words every single one is a completely coherent sci-fi world that's totally unique and different right like this system where you have cardio plates and shit is only in this one story and yet with a few made up words it feels so evocative um so to yeah. the same end the one that got me was to his staff all the ferrets all the loggers all the finks all the comics even the minis he said who is the harlequin? He was not purring smoothly. Time-wise, it was jangle. <laughs> That's like <laughs> clockwork orange status to me. That's very, you're getting yeah. a lot out of a little. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that might have been the only other one I had other than so it goes, so it goes. I did, like, it felt like a joke, but also world building. There's one part where he's listing all of the different strategies that the TikTok man's forces try to find the Harlequin and catch him. And like one of the lines is they used Raul Mitgong, but he didn't help much. And it, it was just Raul Mitgong, according to my Googling is not real. Really like that burn on Raul Mitgong, that idiot. I who... wonder if he knew someone, if that was just some schlubby knew, but I Googled as well. And it's, it's like, <laughs> There's no no one by that name in on the ship, Captain. Um, oh yeah, I did I did find another one that I really like for similar reasons. Uh, the purchasing needs of the system were therefore falling behind, 
and so measures were taken to accelerate the cycle for the rest of the day. But it got bogged down and speeded up, and they sold too many float valves and not enough wegglers, which meant the poply ratio was off. This made it necessary to rush cases of spoiling smash to stores that usually needed a case only every three to four hours. The shipments were bollocks, the trans shipments were misrouted, and in the end, even the swizzle skid industry felt it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is almost veering into Douglas Adams territory because of the oh yeah like you could make up any words swizzle skid you're obviously not a serious person right now <laughs> like you're going for the joke uh, and I do like that both Vonnegut and Allison will go for the joke don't take themselves too seriously uh, yeah like you know like a Bradbury oh God I love Bradbury but yeah none of his joke none of his stories read as like. Ellison and Vonnegut almost have a bit of a stand-up comedian in them at times. And I think that's why I love them both so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, see Everett Marm was destroyed. Oh, which was a loss because of what Thoreau said earlier. <laughs> I still like that breaking of the fourth wall, but we kind of discussed the fourth wall stuff. Yeah. Also notable uh, to Vonnegut's that it ends with very similar to Slaughterhouse Five. It ends with Mermi, 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 compared to Pooty Wheat, Pooty Wheat, Pooty Wheat. Yeah, and yeah, like a animal noise because he purrs, and all, and almost yeah. a sketch comedy ending. That in the end, the TikTok man is the wrong time. Like, great, that's the that's the correct twist at the end. There oh yeah, go. we forgot to say he did. He gets totally crushed by the system, but the system now does ha is slightly off by like six seconds, and you're like, ah, so his life, his work was not in vain. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now the dumbest segment of all, which I know you can appreciate, um, because of the uh, doing the numbers segment on Sifpod. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know Alex will get do silly a vocal with warm me. up. La -la -la. Yeah. Um, but we're gonna do uh. Three dumb one-liners specific to this story that you could kind of only get if you just read this Harlan Ellison short story. So hopefully by the end of this podcast, you know, like there will be a set of jokes about these Harlan Ellison stories. And I doubt that's a thing that's existed before. Uh, jokes about repent Harlequin said the TikTok man. So Alex, if you wouldn't mind, hit me with your first joke. See, I can sing too. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so I... I wish I could do his voice better, especially because you're such a fan of the show, but like comic book guy from The Simpsons, this voice. Mm -hmm. Worst Harlequin romance novel ever. <laughs> nice. Uh, the real question isn't where he got the jelly beans. It's why he chose to include black licorice. That was his true crime. <laughs> do you, does black licorice disgust you or are you a weirdo? I, I, I really like it, actually. Yeah. You like it. <laughs> like Every once in a while, you it's like the guy I know who doesn't like any music. Just like, how are these opinions that people hold? Okay, go again. <laughs> I wonder if the TikTok man tried to be off time at the end on purpose. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, uh, good. Yeah, yeah, good. Mermi. <laughs> Two mermies to that. Terrorizing the city by airboat in Motley and always being late. This Harlequin dude's like if the Green Goblin... Oh, see, this should have been in uh, Dennis Miller voice. This Harlequin dude's like if <laughs> the Green Goblin had a baby with Cody Jenston. Now, that won't scan for most of you, but it cracked, and this is no longer true because he's worked on himself. Uh, Cody Johnston would often be late to meetings. And now mm -hmm. you get that hilarious joke. Alex, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was because Katie me. locked him in his house with Warmbo. That was the problem. Sure. Uh, he... <laughs> oh, it went in doubt. Blame Warmbo. <laughs> um, it, what was weird is Warmbo was always pitching some more news that cracked. And we're like, who is this guy? Who let this puppet in here? Right. And then finally, when crack fell apart, they they were like, now's the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, spooky voice. Never send to know for whom Raoul met gongs. He gongs for thee. <laughs> Dude, that one's so good. <laughs> I bet, like, I think I'm gonna carry around the name Raoul met gong for like any guy who is widely known to not be helpful or good at anything in our yeah, broader like, society. Ooh, 
He's a real Mitt Gong. Yeah. It's like the way Ellison writes him, it's like, obviously Mitt Gong didn't work. We all know. We're all just clear on why that would not work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's in the middle of like, if you ever read Hunt for the Jabberwocky, it's a similar section. Like they hunted him with soap. They hunted him with, they're yeah. like, they, they use the nanites. They use the grid. They asked Raul Mitt Gong, but that piece of crap, <laughs> as you know, is worthless. So that didn't go well. Yeah. You're like, wait, who is this dude we're just shitting on in the middle? All right. <laughs> Final joke. Turns out the Harlequin's real name is Everett C. Marm. I'd burn through the rest of my cardio plate as fast as possible, too. <laughs> Everett C. Marm. Shitty name. <laughs> all right. Um, that's all our stupid, stupid, deeply stupid jokes, except the Mitt Gong one. That was genuinely great. Oh, um, thanks. And for any, Harlan, any listeners yeah. whose last name is Marm, uh, write in. Let us know. <laughs> yeah, it really feels that. made up. And weird <laughs> school marm is a phrase that always stuck in my craw before that reason i'm like what is a marm yeah pap right. smear i have a similar issue with what is pap i gotta know <laughs> uh so write in <laughs> explain what marm and pap are hey uh, i'm a pap marm buddy <laughs> yeah, somebody out there. <laughs> long line of pap marms here <laughs> um alex please tell people about your own wonderful podcast how they can find it where they can find it and where they can follow you I, I make Secretly Incredibly Fascinating, which Michael has very kindly guessed it on before. And it's mm. about things that people think are ordinary. Then we get into history and science and stories about why they're amazing. And uh, I'm on Twitter at Alex Schmidt. I don't know if Twitter will still be a going thing when this releases. But uh, <laughs> that's what people have been saying lately on podcasts. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and th thanks so much for having me on here, man. It was really fun. Oh, my gosh. Honored to have you, as always, Alex. Uh, yeah, Sif Pod's really great. If you haven't heard it, check it out. It's things become incredibly fascinating, and I can't stress enough how mundane they were to start with. Like, I don't know <laughs> if you've done these, but it'll be like hinges or lint, and then it's oh. very interesting. <laughs> yeah, so well done. Patrons picked ball bearings, and I don't know why they're interesting yet, but it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be <laughs> but I'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I'll dig. <laughs> this has been a small beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash small beans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash small beans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you! <laughs>